I felt like uh, it was time to wrap up my series of messages on Ephesians. So I'm going to do that today uh, and tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. Um, but today is message seven of Seated in the Heavens with Yeshua. And the, the focus is the portion of Ephesians that talks about truth and love. So we've been talking for six messages up until now about how Ephesians is really the letter that Yeshua chose to send to Ephesus, and then he tests Ephesus in the, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 2, he sends a letter to Ephesus through John, and he says that she's really great at serving and holding to the truth and being faithful and patient, but he says she lacks love, and he, he tells her, he admonishes her to go back to first love. Now, the book of Ephesians really tells Ephesians what she was going to get tested in and then obviously how to pass that test and so we're at the point where uh, We've talked about discerning the body of Yeshua. We've talked about being seated in the heavens with him Now this means something specific that means that you're going to take a view of the people around you That's similar to the way that Jesus sees the people around you. This requires the Holy Spirit So I'm just going to pray actually Holy Spirit. I'm asking would you um, bless the words that I share that, I, that you gave me to give and I pray that you'd anoint my sharing of them and that they'd be helpful to the body of Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Okay, so item one, the notes, I posted a link to the notes in the, in the message description and I'll put it in the comments after we're done. The narrow road is truth, item one of the notes. The point of the redemptive plan laid out in the Bible is to reconnect us to God so that we can live with him forever in the role assigned to us, which is that of family. So our forever role like what God made man for was to be in the family of God and to be in a family with other people that are in the family of God. So that's really what was broken at the fall of man in the garden, Genesis 3. It, we see that Adam and Eve chose self-leadership, which led to selfishness, and then created all kinds of enmity in the, in the world. So there was enmity between people that came from that there was enmity between spouses that came from that there was enmity in families that came from that enmity between people and animals and people and the environment all of this enmity came from adam and eve choosing self-leadership instead of the leadership of god via the spirit they got impatient basically okay so the the point of the whole redemptive plan from genesis 3 on is to reconnect us to god so we can live with him forever in that family role that he always intended for man. We are God kind. We have an emotional and creative being designed to partner with God forever. And the fall of mankind was actually a fall from truth. So truth is essential. And in fact, in, in the book of Revelation, if you go to Revelation 2, you'll see that Jesus actually recognizes that Ephesus, he says this in Ephesians 2, this isn't in the notes, but this is Ephesians 2 verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So Jesus is saying, I'm in, the, I'm in the church and I've sent you messengers. I've sent you the right information to the church. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars, and you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. So Ephesus cares about truth. Clearly, the church in Ephesus cares about truth, but what they've lost is love. And so right now, we live in a moment where the Bible says that when the church is offered up to tribulation, that many would betray, they'd become offended, betray one another, and that love would grow cold and many false prophets would rise up in that time. And the false prophets, they preach a, a, a gospel other than the true gospel, which is one of we have to change, not that everyone else has to change. The false gospel is all external stuff. The true gospel is internal heart change into selflessness in the leadership of Jesus to the point where we speak truth and love. And that's really the point of discerning the body. Okay, so. We're God kind, we have this emotional being, an uh, emotional and creative being designed to partner with God forever, and the fall of mankind was a fall from truth. The truth is, we can't live apart from God. That's the basic truth, is that we can't lead ourselves. God's intention for man was to have no shame. 
Like we were never supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we can't lead ourselves. We were never supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we don't have as much money as we think we should have. We were never supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we're not as smart as we think we should be. We were never supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we're weak. We were never supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we think we're ugly compared to what an I, you know, what the flesh says the ideal person is. Like all of these things, these are falsehoods that drive mankind and the church, if we're not careful, into actually warring against the kingdom of God, especially in our relationships, in that that role that we were assigned, which is to be a family. We can easily, because of shame, break up relationships or isolate ourselves or overemphasize certain attributes of ourselves or other people, all driven by shame or pride. They're the same thing. So God's intention was for man to have no shame, to be uncovered, to be shining, to be a witness of his manifest presence, much like the moon reflects the sun. Now, this is Genesis 1, 24 to 31. This was God's intention for man. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. So cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. Cattle according to its kind. Everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And what that means is two cows, they have another cow. Two dogs, they mate and have another dog. They bring forth their same kind, okay? And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, uh, according to our likeness, verse 26, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. So we're actually, we're God kind. We're, we're not like any other created thing. The, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves in the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now God, he made man to actually need him. And the next passage that I put in the notes is Genesis 2, 7-9. Without God, we're supposed to be dust. With God, we're actually supposed to have a role that is full of authority, but to have dominion over the earth, and full of creativity. And that's really what everybody kind of craves in their inner man, is we crave to have an impact, to have authority over the way things work, and to be creative. Unfortunately, people get ashamed that they're not as creative as somebody else or have as much authority as somebody else, and they start actually manipulating the environment around them either to isolate because they feel like they're not worthy of the environment or to take more power to themselves. But the, the truth is God wanted man to be weak, to be nothing without him, and that he wanted to take our dust breathe himself into it. He imparted himself into, into mankind. That's what makes us so unique in all creation. That's what makes us God kind. And then he wants us to let him, through us, be creative and be full of authority so that we don't have to be ashamed because it's not really us and we also don't have to steal other people's authority or, their, or be jealous of their creativity because it's not really them. And that's what God's looking for right now in this generation is for us. A group of people that call themselves the church to mature to the point where we discern the creative role in the, the authority role that every part of the body has so that we have peace within us and that we live at peace with other people even to the point where they could be they could not see that in us and we could still see that in them to be like Jesus that's what happened with Jesus Jesus saw every person even those that tried to kill him as somebody that God had made, he saw their creative and authority destiny in God, and he stayed there even when they weren't expressing it themselves. He stayed with God in that. That's what it means to dwell in the heavens with God, is to see people this way. Okay, so this is Genesis 2, 7 and 9. Now, practically, you should be thinking about the people that resist you and the way that you react to them. Do you react to them with God seeing, oh, they have authority, even if they're not acting like it, and they have a, a creative role. They don't need to be ashamed of anything. They, what, what's really hampering them is their pride or their shame. They're either trying to, to take authority, or they're jealous of other people's creativity, or they're ashamed of their own and they're trying to isolate. So we're supposed to see that. We're supposed to see this basic 
human problem that everyone has until they repent out of it. Every single person, we, we express it in many different ways, many different symptoms of this one disease. There's one thing broken, and the one thing broken is to, to be connected, to abide in God to the point where we feel loved and we feel free to be just our plain old selves, weak little old us, and let God do something amazing to us. So we don't believe that we're nothing. We believe we're amazing because God made us, and, but we're only amazing when we're connected to him and led by him and empowered by him in his grace. This is a narrow road. This is very narrow. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, sick. okay so Genesis 2, 7-9. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So man is unique in all of creation. We're made to reflect the glory of God. We're made to witness the dominion of God to all creation. That means we're supposed to, we're supposed to actually... Let creation see the gentle, kind, peaceful, patient, loving, joyful, self-controlled way God rules over all creation. That's the way we're supposed to actually exercise our peace of the authority of God is with the fruit of the Spirit manifesting so that creation can see the sons of God being revealed. That's what it says in Romans 8. It says all creation is groaning. So when we see the, the earthquakes and the, you know, the heat domes and the floods and the, you know, the hurricanes and all the, all the ways creation is groaning, Creation is in pain. It's, it's lacking this witness of the, the nature of God through man in its dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the, the trees and everything else. And so that's what, we're, that's what we're actually supposed to be our target as believers in Yeshua is not that all that would line up with God. It's that we would and that as we do, our three square feet become the kingdom of God. And the more that we do that, the more that kingdom expands and according to Isaiah, that increase of his government will never end. It will actually overtake not only our earth, but the planets that were formed. That's, that's what it says. Okay, so we're made to witness the dominion of God to all creation. Creation reflects the leadership that we choose. Now, this is very practical for marriages, for families, for cities, the environment, weather, the way animals relate to man. Those are all judgments that we read about in the book of Revelation because as, as the church refuses to be internal instead of external, as we become pharisaical and we're like, we tell everybody else how they should change, but we don't change ourselves. Then God is gonna give us over to what we want and we're gonna see the failure of the very things that we have the power in us, the Holy Spirit in us. So this is real practical. It's very tempting for the church to look at the world and say, okay, when the homosexual stop being homosexual, then the renewal will start or the cities would be better, but that's not actually true. What's true is those who have the Holy Spirit in them, we're the ones that have the power to change, A, and we're the ones that have God inside of us that have recognized our actual redemptive and creative role with God. We're the ones that are failing when the kingdom of God's not manifesting. It's not people that don't have the Holy Spirit. The people that don't have the Holy Spirit, they can't do anything about that. They're, God has decided in his wisdom to make his kingdom one of shepherding. A shepherd goes first. A shepherd, that's what Jesus did. Jesus filled with the Spirit from birth, showed us how to live in the Spirit. He didn't expect people that didn't have the Spirit to be able to do that. In fact, he said, unless you come through me on the gate, you can't, come, you can't enter the kingdom. And so that's what we're, we're really supposed to be doing right now is readjusting our view from one of being external. That's an immature view that, you know, God needs to save everybody like he saved us to an internal one to say, oh, Jesus deserves a lot more out of me. He deserves me to line up a lot more with who he is and the way he thinks and the emotions he feels and what he does, and the, especially the way he sees people. I, if I don't see people the way Yeshua sees people, then I've got a big problem. I'm actually not abiding in who he is as I witness to the earth who I say he is. That makes me a false witness, okay? So uh, man, man is unique in all creation in the fact that we can do this, fill the Holy Spirit. Also, we're made to need God. We're the only creation that God imparted himself into, and we're made to not be alone. So God said when he made Eve, he said, it's not good that man be alone. That's not just a marriage reality, and not just a, a husband and wife or male-female reality. That is a, we're made to live in a community with other people. You're going to find that being true in a community of other people in love is impossible without the leadership of the Holy Spirit. 
because it's it's what we're made to do with God. We're supposed to be weak at that. And if you have ever tried to live in truth in a community of people and in love, you're going to find, oh, I'm so weak at that. I fail either in the truth part or I fail in the love part. That's You're, you're made that way. You're supposed to be that way. Those who actually want to live in heaven forever, they admit that. And then they, they let God be the strength of that requirement because it is required. Okay, so the truth that was lost in the fall is that we are to be re, is what we're to be reborn into embracing. We're supposed to be embracing the truth that was lost in the fall, which is we can't live without God. Otherwise, we can't even see the kingdom. Okay, so this is John 3, 1 to 10. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that your teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus, he was seeing something with his eyes and thinking something with his mind. He was witnessing something that he couldn't understand. He's like, you have to be from God because you're doing these things. But he actually wasn't willing to humble himself and see that he couldn't do these things for a reason. He could see that Jesus could do them, but he couldn't see that he didn't understand it because he was lacking something. He was arrogant. And that's what Jesus is about to tell him this. Okay, so Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel, I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and don't know these things? He was saying, Nicodemus, you are lacking so much humility to see that you're lacking what it takes to basically teach about God. You don't even know what to teach about God because you can't see that I do things because I'm connected to something you're not connected to. This is an admonition to all of us. We should look at what Jesus requires, the basic minimum requirements of being a believer. Actually, you can find it in Mark. So when you go to Mark, Matthew, Mark, the very last chapter of Mark, Jesus actually says what you as a New Testament believer should be like. And this, this wasn't just like, uh, you know, hopefully you'd eventually someday be like this. This is like you should be mourning the fact that you're not like this. Okay, so he says this in verse um, 16. He says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. So this is the basic requirement of being a believer. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We should be in pain that we don't do this like Jesus did. We're not supposed to look at Jesus and be like, oh man, that's amazing. And you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get saved and he does that stuff. And maybe someday I'll do that. We should actually be crying out day and night, asking and receiving more and more and more of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So in first Corinthians 11, it says that because the church in Corinth wouldn't discern the body, many of them were sick. And then in first Corinthians 12, he started, Paul starts to talk about the pouring out of the Spirit and, and where the ability to do all those things comes from. And we have to actually search ourselves. We're supposed to be living in the Sermon on the Mount where we say, oh, what? why don't I lay my hands on the sick and see them healed like Jesus did? Now, we, I, I personally have laid my hands on lots of sick people and seen them healed, but not every time and not to the measure or the degree that Jesus did. And that should pain me, and it does actually pain me. I should be pained that I don't, hear God clearly, especially under pressure. I should be pained that I get afraid of my own health. Like if I get afraid of sickness, that should pain me. That, that's, a, that's a shame or a pride reality. I shouldn't be okay that, that I'm not living in the fullest, not because I deserve more, but because Jesus deserves a witness that is true on the earth. There's, there's barely any of this witness on the earth right now. We should all be actually crying out, fasting and praying that Jesus would get a witness worthy of his glory on the earth. That's what he prayed for in John 17, okay? And so the kingdom of God is the government of God and that is relationships. And so one of the main ways that we could know the kingdom is coming and that we're going to start to manifest that same power is that we would actually start to humble ourselves and recognize we don't relate to each other very well in the church. We're, we're not actually 
free of shame, we're actually guarding our hearts in many ways, we're jealous of what other people have, or we feel condemned in the lack of what we have. And rather than take all of that lateral looking and look to Jesus and mourn it 24-7, crying out to him that he would avenge his own elect, that he would avenge the, us against the flesh and take us into the spirit. Like we should be mourning that so that Jesus would get a witness that would bring the kingdom of God to earth. Now, this is what Jesus is doing right now, actually, all over the earth. Is he's convicting souls that they need actually to be more worthy of him, that they, they actually need to spend more time actually asking and receiving from him because the trouble in the earth is increasing. And I could go a million directions right now, talking about judgment, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the gospel, talking about the end time trouble that's coming and how we have to actually get above it. We have to lift our heads and get above it. But I'm going to try to stay focused on this Ephesians part, okay? So we must be born again to see relationships with God and our fellow family of God rightly. We have to actually be looking at people by the Spirit's judgments, by the Spirit's emotions. So when, when somebody offends you, your flesh emotions will rise up and you'll you'll start to think differently about somebody that offends you. But the Holy Spirit already knew that that person would offend you. The Holy Spirit is not surprised by somebody betraying you or you know, misunderstanding you or you know, turning against you. The Holy Spirit's not surprised by any of that. So if we get into this Holy Spirit's place, and we'll say, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you think about that? And what do you feel about that? Then we'll relate to our enemies differently. This is a basic witness of who Jesus is. If you can't relate to people who treat you poorly in church like Jesus loves them, you have a huge, a massive problem. If you isolate and get ashamed and you start to group up with other people and try to actually convince other people to see things your way or manipulate them so that they think you're good or somebody else is bad, you, you're, you're completely outside of the gospel. You can't do that and be okay with Jesus. And if that's you, that makes you a normal human, but you have to repent, which is what Jesus, what, what Jesus said through Paul to the church in Ephesus was, You've got to get back to first love. You've got to get back to this basic idea that you're not the greatest believer ever and everybody else is, you know, dim-witted and unable to get it. And also that God really loves you. He likes you weak like you are. He likes you when you just began. He called you at your worst. So wherever you're at right now, you can afford to just be weak. You can afford to just be in his arms and forgiving your enemies and that they don't cost you anything because he's your complete source and your complete reward. So we have to be born again to see uh, our relationships in the church rightly. Jesus is the truth. He's the narrow gate in a difficult way, but that narrow gate in difficult way is the only path to living forever with God. It's what I'm describing is truth and love. And what I'm describing is being willing to know something is true and to still love people that are offending the truth like Jesus does in patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and still be willing to speak what is true without ramping up to win an argument or ignoring it and trying to act like it's not happening and then gritting your teeth and pushing down all the emotions of, of the ways people mistreat you. The normal human mode, people that are going to hell, that's the way that they relate to each other. They ignore offenses, they try to, or they ramp up to push people back that they feel like are offending them and then they grit their teeth on their emotions and try to isolate and guard their hearts so it doesn't happen to them again. That's everybody going to hell. That's how they are. People that are going to heaven, what they do is they recognize, I'm going to get mistreated. People are going to misunderstand me. I'm going to love them like Jesus loves them. I'm going to stay open to them anyway. I'm going to actually ask God to help me feel how he feels about me so that I can, in truth, continue to love people but not deny what's really happening and then when God gives me opportunity in his leadership I'm gonna actually tell people what I see God saying about the way that they're treating me or treating other people that's truth in love and this is over and over in the Bible this is required if you don't embrace this fully you can't live in heaven ever you will never live in heaven if you don't embrace that so Jesus is the truth he's a narrow gate in a difficult way but that narrow gate in a difficult way is the only path to living with God forever Jesus only told the truth Jesus only loved he never was unloving he never treated anyone unloving ever even when he told the Pharisees you brood of vipers he did that only because he loved them and he wanted to give them a chance to to repent and to live with him forever he was he was actually inviting them to repent and live with him forever when he did that the ditches on either side of the road this narrow road and this narrow gate are ignoring the truth or ramping up to win arguments and getting out of love. 
The tension between truth and love requires the spirit to navigate. You can't do it in the flesh. You can only do it by a miracle. This is what is called the narrow road in the Bible. Clearly, this is, this is what's defined as the narrow road. So you hear people say this all the time. Well, it's a narrow road. Well, this is the narrow road. This is the only narrow road described in the Bible. This is Matthew 7, 7 to 14. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So very, right at the very beginning, he says, there's some stuff you need. That's the narrow road. The very entrance to the narrow road is recognizing your spiritual poverty. This is reiterated in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. For everyone who asks, receives. So if you're lacking an ability to be truthful with people and not afraid of conflict, but loving at the same time, that's, you're supposed to ask and receive the ability to do that like Jesus did. That's a basic requirement. Now, there's many things tied to that. There's many emotional uh, trappings that are tied to that. So there's many things that we can repent of and there's many things we can ask for. We can ask for joy. Maybe we were depressed and that actually affects the way that we relate to other people. We can repent of depression. We could ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with joy. We could, we could look at how anxiety actually breaks relationships or fear or greed or jealousy. Like There's so many ways this manifests. Shame. But we have to actually be diligent to get into this narrow road by saying, God, i got to change the way that I relate to people. Jesus, you related to your enemies differently than I'm relating to mine. Help me. And then we, if we see that this really works, what will happen is we'll pray more and more with other people, stirring up each other in love and good works, even more so as we see the day of Jesus' approaching come near, because the earth so desperately needs a witness of Jesus' personality in the midst of judgment. So when you look around outside and you're like, it's getting dark outside, that should pain us that Jesus isn't clearly seen by the world. And that's what Jesus was praying for in John 17. He says, I've given, given them your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by the truth. As, just as I sanctified myself, sanctify them, Father. And not only them, but everyone who believes in me because of, because of their witness. And he says, make them one as we are one. Me and you, you and me, them and us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's what Jesus wants right now. He wants a John 17 witness of selfless living in the midst of great resistance from the other parts of the church and what will happen is out will pop up your spotless bride this is birth pains this is what's being described in matthew 24 starting in verse 9 all the way through verse 15 and it says you got to have endurance you got and this is what he's saying to ephesus he's like if you lack this first love you won't endure you won't overcome the tribulation i'm going to remove your lampstand you don't want to get removed as a tear as a fruitless uh member of the body of Jesus. If you're fruitless, you're not abiding, you're cut off and thrown in the fire. That's what it says in John 15. Okay, so the tension between truth and love because the spirit to navigate this is in their road. Ask, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just remembering where I was. Matthew 7, 7 to 14, it's verse 8. Everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And in Luke, we find out that he's, he's primarily talking about the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit grace to overcome our own personality that we were born with and take on the personality of Jesus. Therefore, so this is the, this is the most important verse of this section to understand why this is the narrow road. Therefore, whatever what you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is what you should be asking for. You should be asking to grow in a grace to love your neighbor as yourself because you're loving God with all your mind, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And these are the first and second commandments are all in this passage. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. If you don't do this, you're not entering into heaven. If, you're, if this isn't the main thing that you do in your life, is actually letting God put you in circumstances that test your ability to be like Jesus under pressure, and then when you recognize your weakness, to cry out to him and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to change the fact that I'm weak. I want to actually give myself to your leadership in this area. And then he comes and he fills you with power. Now, the temptation, when you get this far, is to be condemned because you're weak and then greet your teeth and say, okay, I'm going to be more patient with people, I'm going to be more loving with people, more kind with people. That's what Ephesus was doing in Revelation 2. And Jesus like, you lost your first love. If you don't have the first love, you're never going to do the second one. You have to get back to that. Oh, it's not my, it's not my strength that keeps me in a relationship with Yeshua. It's his willingness to take a weak man 
and actually be his strength and that I don't have to fix the things that are wrong around me. I don't have to get everybody to see me right. I don't have to be ashamed if I don't feel like I measure up. I can just belong to God because he loves me. And what that will do is give you an emotional chemistry that endures resistance and makes you pure and spotless. That's what you really need. Okay, so he says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, you know that you're not in this narrow way when you're offended with people, and you just write them off, or you guard yourself against them, or you try to get away from people in the church that you think aren't doing things right, or you feel like you have to correct everyone and control everything around you, or God's going to be missed or not served. Like, this is the Antichrist spirit, and we can't give into it. This is a self-centered, self-focused, self-saving spirit. We actually have to be a people that are like, okay, I don't have to agree with you. I need to agree with Jesus, and I don't do that great. So I'm not going to judge how you agree with Jesus. I'm actually going to focus on letting Jesus lead me through, navigate these relationships that are difficult, and to become more like him. I'm going to see the enti my entire life is a training ground for heaven. That this, all, all of the trouble, all of the challenges, all the tribulation, these are the perfect context to get me the most ready to live with Jesus forever. And if I miss it, I only get one life to live. I only have one heart to give, and I got one life to lay it down. And if I don't lay it down now, when will I? And I want to live with him. I want to be with him. I want to be like him. Okay, now... Most, though, most people in the church won't walk this narrow road. And so you have to know if you're like, well, I don't see anybody else teaching this. I don't see anybody else doing this. You have to know that's what the Bible says. It's, most people that walk aren't going to heaven. They don't, they don't want to be changed. They just want to be saved. They want everybody else to be changed. They want their world saved. They want their reputation saved. They want their emotions saved. They want their money saved. They want their family saved. That will never get you to heaven. You have to be willing to give all those things up and seek first the kingdom, and then all the rest is added unto you. That's the only gospel there is. There's no other gospel. So shame, which was introduced at the fall, is what keeps us from the narrow road and speaking truth and love. Jesus always spoke what was completely true in the fullness of love. Jesus was never ashamed of the truth. Now, most people, they'll complain to other people, but they will never directly confront someone who's openly resisting them or doing something wrong. And they don't realize that that makes you a false witness. You actually have to be a person that is pained by the wrong things in the body of Jesus, but also corrects people gently and in love and primarily through prayer and, let, and seeing for yourself how you do the very same thing somebody else does. If you notice bad behavior in somebody else in the body of Jesus, it's because you do it. You understand it. Like you're, you're somehow also in it enough to recognize it and so that puts it on you to say, okay, Lord, am I clean? And this is what it says in Matthew 6, it says, or in Matthew 7, it says, don't try to remove the speck from your brother's eye without getting the log out of your own eye. And that's what he's talking about just before this narrow road passage in Matthew 7. So the end of the Sermon on the Mount is describing the need for what the book of Ephesians actually lays out in detail how to get it, okay? So uh, Jesus always spoke what was completely true in the fullness of love. And this is the only path back into heaven. You have to learn how to actually do this. Now, this starts, first of all, with yourself, where, you're, where your flesh doesn't like the leadership of the Spirit. You have to be honest about that. You have to actually be like, hey, I'm actually not that great at following God. I'm weak, but he actually called me when I was weak. So I can have confidence to just tell him how I don't really follow him right. I don't even want to sometimes. I want to want to. Like, that's where it starts. But then it has to go to your spouse or the people that are closest to you. If you're a kid, it's your parents. If you're a parent, you know, if you're a spouse, it's your spouse. That's, that's what he talks about next in Ephesians. After this Ephesians 4 passage that we're about to read, he starts to talk in Ephesians 5 about husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Children, honor your parents. Like, he's talking about the way that we relate to each other in the closest relationships. So we have to recognize that it's very tempting to grit our teeth and act like nothing's wrong in our marriage because we don't want to disrupt the boat in our marriage. And we don't realize that that's actually counter to Jesus' destiny for married couples. What Jesus wants for a married couple is to learn how to talk to each other and not, not be condemned and not be ashamed and not be upset, just to have an honest conversation about what needs to change and then pray for each other and stir each other up to love and good works and encourage one another to do the right thing and to hold each other up when our emotions fall and to remind us of what Jesus feels. Like this this is the basic tenet of marriage. Like this is the basic reality. And 
And that's one of the pictures of the way Jesus loves us according to the Bible. Okay, So, uh, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he himself, speaking of Yeshua, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So a great practical application is you might have a spouse and you, there's something that your spouse does that annoys you and you're like, that's not what Jesus wants for you. Well, the truth is you recognize that because there's some part of you that does that too. So before you try to take the, the speck out of your spouse's eye, you've actually got to take the log out of your own eye and you've got to recognize that you're prone to be impatient with your spouse. You're prone to be non-confrontational with your spouse. You're prone to actually deflect and, and reassign these frustrations into other places. And so the devil gets in and actually starts dividing you from your spouse, even though you grit your teeth and try to act like everything's great. That's the devil's plan for every marriage. You don't want to let that happen. You actually want to be like, okay, Lord, I need you to address this. I, I need you to address it in my spouse, for sure. I can see it there, but where is it in me? What am I doing? It's like that. Now, this is the same with truth, same truth with church relationships. You might notice somebody who's in bad behavior in the church and be frustrated and redirect that frustration in a bunch of little manipulative ways and controlling ways to try to get other people to see that person the way you see them. But the truth is, we're supposed to actually see, oh, that's part of my body. Like, we're all part of the same body. And if my arm's broken, I want to bandage it, and I want to, I want to recognize, okay, how come I'm seeing that? Why can I recognize that? And I don't think everybody else is seeing it. Is that something I'm doing, God? Is that something that actually needs to get taken out of my eye before I can ever help that person with it? This will cause a prayer life to really grow. You have so much to pray about. In so little time, really, Jesus is coming so soon. And if you don't do this before he comes, he won't take you. He literally will not take you with him. Okay. Uh, item two, lying and manipulation break the body. So the very next passage, uh, Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, we have to learn to speak truth and love like we just read about. But this is, this is what the, uh, Paul says to Ephesus, how to speak truth and love. So you might hear the idea of truth and love often, but you have to actually know how to do it. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. Ephesians is a very practical book. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now that right there should be like, okay, do I kind of deal with problems in my marriage or in the church or with my kids the way that the world does? Like, do I believe in worldly advice for dealing with people? You have to come out of that. That's futility. Any manipulation is futility. You actually have to come into, okay, I don't actually want those people to change. I want to shepherd them. I want to change. I'm not going to do it like the world does it. I'm going to do it like Jesus does it. Jesus didn't come and tell anybody to change. He actually showed people how to live united to the Holy Spirit. He healed people, and then he told them, don't, go sin, don't sin anymore. You're going to go back to what you were. But he was always leading people forward into something new. Are, is that what you're doing? Is that what I'm doing? Okay, so this is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. Don't walk in the futility of your mind like, like the Gentiles do. Having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God. They can't see this Holy Spirit-led way because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, and they don't even know it. I mean, the way the world solves problems, just look around, look outside, it's getting worse. Even our best efforts to deal with the climate, to deal with peace, to deal with the economy, to deal with the, in, the discrepancies in money, it's getting worse. And it, that's what he's talking about. He's saying it's, it's past feeling. It's into lewdness trying to solve these problems. And it's getting, I mean, the, the whole culture is becoming corrupt with sexual sin and pornography and, you know, depravity and greed and taking advantage of one another. Thefts are increasing, like sorceries are increasing, burgers increasing. And it's all because of this same reality. So if you want to see that end, the only way it's going to end is if you come out, if you come out as a witness shining like a shepherd 
so that other people that don't have the Holy Spirit could be like, how did you do that? I want that spirit, including your spouse and your kids, primarily your spouse and your kids, and you. You're supposed to see, oh, this part of my heart got redeemed, not because I clamped down on it, but because I gave it to God. I can give the rest of my issues to God as well. I can be weak is what that means, okay? Uh, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you've, you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying. So lying is the main way that we don't speak truth and love to one another. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor if we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. So when you're angry, that's when you're the most tempted to not speak truth and love. These aren't dis disconnected realities. He's saying something here about how to speak truth and love. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, if you're going to do that, that means you have to confront the things that are making you angry. You actually have to be like, I'm unwilling to just grit my teeth and wait this out. I'm actually going to be asking the Holy Spirit, search me, make me clean. I repent, now give me an opportunity, a window, to be able to speak the truth and love to my brother in the same kindness and gentleness and self-control that Jesus speaks to me with. That is very difficult to do. This takes growing. This is a process of abiding. This is actually the antiphony of the prayer room, the antiphony of the Gospels. That means opposing voices, people seeing things from different angles. If you're really willing to let the Lord speak to you through other people, you're going to see, oh, I'm not nearly as confident in how right I was as I was when I was just listening to me, nor am I as quick to judge somebody else because I realize, oh, I can fall into error myself. This, this will soften a bunch of the relationships in the body of Jesus if we did this, okay? Uh, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. It's when we grit our teeth and try to push down the things that we see are wrong and the way it leaks out in other places. We gossip, we get jealous, we build coalitions, we try to get with the like-minded. That's where the devil gets in. Okay? So he says, don't, don't get place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor. Let, we have to see, okay, am I jealous? Is there just something I want that somebody else has and I can't even recognize it because I'm not thinking right. I'm not seeing it like the Holy Spirit does. Holy Spirit, am I jealous? That's a great question just to ask sometimes. Holy Spirit, am I jealous of that person that's annoying me? Holy Spirit, am I, do I want what they have or do I, I wish they didn't have it? Okay? Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, and it is necessary to edify people, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, just a lot of speaking, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Like, you have to actually learn how to see your enemies as beautiful creations of God that are being afflicted by a demon. Now, the next message, the last message in Ephesians is going to be spiritual warfare. This is the prelude to that message, that you're not fighting against flesh and blood, but the prince and power of the air. There's somebody, there's an a entity attacking the body of Jesus. And if you look at that part of the body of Jesus or that part of humanity, and you're like, those people are bad, these people are bad, these people are bad, then you're with Satan. You don't want to be with Satan. You actually want to be with Jesus. And he's like, I came to seek and save the lost. That's, that's somebody I love. That's somebody I made for a creative, authoritative role forever. I want to see them free from the grip of the enemy. I don't condemn them, but I do condemn the devil that's attacking them. Okay? Uh, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Now, mankind naturally tries to keep relationships in our own strength. That's the mode when you first get introduced to the church, the body, that's the only mode you know, is actually trying to be polite, being nice, listening more than you're talking, uh, you know, when people annoy you, trying to act like it doesn't annoy you. And if you don't repent of your flesh in that area, you will never mature. You'll never change. You'll always just keep trying more and more and more to clamp down, grit your teeth, serve other people. And that's what Ephesus was doing in Revelation 2. And that's why he said, you left your first love. You actually have to be open to the fact that all of you need to change together. And this is a beautiful mix of humanity. 
And it doesn't have to annoy you. It doesn't annoy Jesus. It actually is something Jesus sees, and he's calling every human soul to himself if they're willing to come. And everyone willing to come, their destiny is it's predestined that they will become a son of God if they're willing to come and be changed. But if you think you're coming and not changing, you're de deceiving yourself, and the truth is not in you. Okay. So the fleshy alternative to being transformed is to try to keep relationships in your own strength. And most people think that's polite. They think that's what you're supposed to do. But they're wrong, and they're false witnesses in the body of Jesus. God, Jesus is not looking for a bunch of people to stay quiet and kind of go to church meetings together until he comes back, and then he'll kind of sort everything out, all the bad behavior. That's never going to happen. He's actually given us the context right now to partner with him and him releasing grace through us to mature a body of believers into something beautiful that's worthy of him. And if you're not part of that, you're not part of that. You just aren't. So the fleshy alternative to being transformed to Jesus, uh, that this, this is the fleshy alternative, this trying to keep relationships in your own strength. It's the fleshy alternative to being transformed to Jesus, uh, and that's what creates the wide road of destruction. So there's a typo in the notes, but it... Really, it's trying to keep relationships in our own strength that makes that wide road to destruction. It's just kind of letting everybody believe, hey, everything's fine. We're just going to keep on keeping on until Jesus comes back. We'll feed some poor people. You know, we'll spread the gospel, whatever that gospel is. That's the wide road of destruction. And Jesus says most are going to find that. You have to find the narrow road of you changing and becoming more able to love people that hate you, that curse you, that despise you, that spit on you, that try to take your stuff, that lie about you. This is a, what's called a cross. And if you don't take up your cross and follow Jesus, you can't be his disciple. Okay? So when we walk the wide road, we deceive ourselves that our efforts to keep peace with others is acceptable to God. It's not. Your efforts to keep peace with others is unacceptable to God. It will never hold up. It will never work. And it's not real. He's looking for you to repent of your inability to keep peace with others and then to let him show you who they are from his perspective by the Holy Spirit. When we walk the wide road, we don't change. We never get ready to live with Jesus in complete truth and love forever. When we walk the wide road, we become false witnesses to others that they can have Jesus and win the world at the same time. That's mostly why people walk the wide road, is they want to be seen by other people as good. They don't want to get into confrontations because they don't want people thinking they're bad. They don't want to, they don't want to, they'd just rather avoid all trouble and have everybody like them that's the wide road of destruction because that's you care more about, about the way you look than you, Jesus being seen is true. Okay, so we become false witnesses. That's impossible to win the world, to win the world's love and affection, and at the same time have Jesus. It will never happen. We have to come out of the world. We have to actually go away different than the world. We have to speak the truth in love. When we walk the wide road, we choose not to love others, and we ourselves don't want to be loved into truth either. We don't want anybody telling us what's wrong with us, and we don't want to tell anybody what's wrong with them, and we just think, we just kind of mind our own business and try to be good people, that it will all work out good for us because we believed in Jesus. But if you believe in Jesus, you wouldn't do any of that. You would know you can't be a good person. No one will get saved by being a good person. You will only get saved by being conform to the image of Jesus and led by his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit wants to save people. He wants to save your spouse and your kids and you and the people around you. He wants you to be a witness of how to get saved. No lying is acceptable to Jesus. There's no such thing as a white lie. And this is one of the most common ways that we get out of speaking the truth in love is we make up all kinds of lies and we don't call them lies. Okay? So these are some examples that the Holy Spirit gave me. Making up regulations and rules to deal with the one or two people who are doing something wrong that we don't want to we don't want to confront directly. So we'll make a whole rule, you know. No coffee in church because there's this person who refuses to, you know, recognize the cost of the carpet and the need to be careful. Or no phones in church because we refuse to talk to this person about, you know, you have to actually figure out why are you here? Like what are you what are you trying to get? Like why, what, what is here to, to grab onto and to take in? We, we tend to create a context to deal with everybody rather than have a confrontation with one or two people for the thing that we know is, in, is painting the body. That, that will not stand with Jesus. Jesus is speaking to us individually at a very specific level about what he wants us to change. Now, that doesn't mean that we're like, okay, you get off your phone or you can't have coffee or whatever, you know, whatever the dumb thing that happens in a church body that bugs you is, instead we have to say, okay, Jesus, why does this bug me so much? Like, what is the, the log in my eye? Am I afraid of being distracted? Am I afraid of ruining stuff? Am I, you know, it, what, what is it? So that 
we can then pray in a way that's helpful for the right window of opportunity to say the, the perfect simple phrase that will unlock somebody's heart at just the right time. This takes patience and faith and love and self-control and kindness and gentleness. This takes all the fruit of the Spirit. This will only happen by a miracle. This is If you don't do this, you can't live in heaven with him forever. You, there's no other way. He's the only gate in a difficult way, and few are going to find it. You have to ask and receive your way into it. Okay. Um, another way that we lie is we create a context that explains a choice to try and fix behavior. So we, at one point in time, we were going to church with, uh, some people, and there was a, a relationship, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, and rather than address the boyfriend and girlfriend relationship, there was this whole attempt to like create a context. Well, we're, we're, we're really concerned about you know this other thing, and so let's just say we're doing this, and that's why there can't be a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship here in this situation. Like that's that's lying and manipulation. You can't do that. You actually have to actually actually have to address things head on. Okay, ignoring sin. And blessing rebellion, like there's a lot of this where you just want to encourage somebody. You want to encourage them. The Holy Spirit's not necessarily encouraging that behavior, but you think, oh, they just need to be encouraged. So you try to pick out a good thing to be kind about, and you bless them and ignore the sinful behavior that pains the Holy Spirit, and you don't recognize that because you're actually probably caught up in some of the same stuff yourself. God actually requires that we don't do that, that we do not ignore sin and just bless people and encourage them. When he's not, sometimes he's not encouraging people. Sometimes he's actually calling them to repent. And if you're encouraging them, you're working counter to him, and you want to know the difference. Being kind to someone's face and then later complaining about them, that's one of the ways we lie. That's, that's, a, that's completely unacceptable in the body of Christ, is to, to be kind to somebody's face and then complain about them later. If you have a problem with them, you have to talk to them about it before you talk to anybody else about it. Exaggerating or fabricating an emphasis on a doctrine or a leader's doctrine to get others to see things your way. That's an, another way that we can lie. We could actually overemphasize something that the, the church doesn't value or that a leader doesn't value in order to tell somebody else, oh, well, you know, so-and-so said this, and this is so important, you got to do this. And you're actually using two, two other people to get what you think somebody should be doing. That, this is a, a big no-no in the body of Jesus. We're supposed to actually let other people connect to Jesus, not to the teaching of some ministry leader or someone else trying to manipulate them into saying things our way. Um, these are all the ways the world walks in the futility of its own mind. So if you look at this, this set of things, this is the world does this all the time. This is, this is basically how you run a company. But we don't want to be like that. We have to actually be people that aren't of the world. We're not in the world. We're actually people that shepherd. We go first. We let God change us and then we shine to the people that we love. And when the Holy Spirit says it's appropriate and usually when there's a question of why are you doing that that way, we tell them the truth in love, not trying to force them into something. Okay, We must put away these lies from the body of Jesus and simply address the truth head on, but in love. Edification is necessary. What Jesus wants and thinks is more important than what we would think is nice or helpful. This is a narrow road. It must be done in love. Okay, so this is Galatians 2, 11 and 14. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So he basically was lying. I mean, he, he wasn't actually being truthful. He acted one way with one group and another way with another group. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away. Now, this wasn't just affecting Peter. It was actually affecting Barnabas, who was one of, of Paul's disciples. And he's like, this has to be addressed because it's not loving. It's not loving to Peter. It's not loving to Barnabas. But it's not loving to Jesus. This is his body that's being corrupted. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews... Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We must correct one another, but in the spirit. Jesus is very gentle, but he is immovably true. He will never stray from the truth. Most people don't initially want Jesus' correction, even his gentle correction. Most people don't want to hear how they did something wrong. They're ashamed and embarrassed. Doing Ephesians 4 correctly, it will always get you a cross. If you, your walk with Jesus doesn't result in a cross, you aren't actually walking with Jesus. There has to be times where you stay meekly and humbly loyal to Jesus in patience and in faith for the other person where they misinterpret it and accuse you of being 
legalistic or self-righteous or controlling or lying or manipulating, if that doesn't happen, then you're not like Jesus. You actually have to have that happen. Now, most people, when that happens to them, they self-defend and they actually get themselves out of the cross and they don't realize they just harden their heart to being like Jesus even more. Okay. Now, 2 Peter 3, 14 to 18. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him by, in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation is also our beloved brother Paul. Now, this is Peter who had been corrected by Paul earlier. And he learned the lesson. Actually, this is actually what he's saying. He's saying that this thing is the thing that Paul preaches. And he says, actually, it's hard to understand. But Peter was open to being corrected, and it matured him and softened him and actually drew him closer to Paul. So the conflicts that you're afraid of happening, these are the things that you've got two people willing to actually be in love with Jesus and corrected by him, the conflicts will actually make you stronger if you're both willing to be unashamed and unafraid, connected to the vine and loving your enemies. If you do that, then the actual enemy will find himself in the very pit that he dug and the body of Jesus will become stronger. And this is what happened with Peter and Paul. Okay? So he says, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of Scripture. You, therefore, beloved, since you knew this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of, the, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both glory now and forever. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We're supposed to mature into seeing Jesus' correction as edifying and protecting, not accusing, condemning, or shaming. This is very hard, especially in family relationships. It's especially difficult in marriage situations and with your kids. And we have to be extra gentle. This is, this is something that the Lord has been very uh, stern with me about, is to, to see how I am very quick to judge the people closest to me and to micro-correct them. And he's like, that's the most damaging place to do that because those are the closest relationships. So we have to be people that we are willing to be gentle and kind and long-suffering, especially with those that we love. And then we have to see our own correction is not accusing or condemning or shaming, but edifying and protecting. When somebody tells you something you're doing wrong and that they know it's going to disrupt the boat, they're doing that because they love you and because they actually want to see you with Jesus forever. And we're supposed to actually learn how to see that. And even if they didn't do that with that intention, that is Jesus' intention. And he always has your best in mind. Okay, now many lead the body of Jesus away from Jesus by refusing to embrace their own correction and instead giving into that feeling of shame and offense. That makes you a false witness when you do that. These will be cast out of the body because they're not, they do not abide, but rather isolate with the like-minded or like-offended or like-agenda. Jesus' body is intentionally diverse. If you try to find the people that think the same thing you think, if you try to find a very small group, if you think the narrow road is something you can see with your flesh and go find and connect to, then what you don't realize is that you don't see the diversity of Jesus' body. The narrow road is actually embracing the diversity of the way Jesus' body sees things and letting him sort out wheat from tares and not you. So that's the parable of the wheat and tares in Matthew 13. The servant says, should we take the tares out of the wheat? And the master says, no. And the interpretation was the angels are going to actually remove the tares, not you. Your job is to actually let me make you wheat, <laughs> like be fruitful in the way that I see people. Like, you want to see people the way Jesus does. Okay, so Jesus' body is intentionally diverse. Many viewpoints, many voices, one desire, though. We must learn, and that one desire is to be like Jesus. We must learn to live in that reality in love. Right doctrine won't save anybody. It's only the Holy Spirit's leadership that will save anyone. I and mean, that's only possible by the blood of Jesus paying the price for your sin that separated you from the leadership of the Spirit. And the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, self-control, and goodness. So we have to actually recognize it's that leadership that produces those character traits in me. That's the only salvation there is. There's no, there's no heresy hunting, right doctrine that's going to save anybody. It's only the, the blood of the Lamb and the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the alternative to doing what I just said, which is leaving yourself in the crucible to be changed, 
The alternative is to partner with darkness to try to, in the flesh, achieve what only God can do in our own humble willingness to grow. And this is Ephesians 5, 8 to 13. This is the last passage. For you were once darkness. You were darkness when Jesus found you. There wasn't any part of you that was light when Jesus found you. He, any light that you have is something he imparted to you as you let him lead you. And you humbled yourself and let him love you. And you have to remember this. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Jesus does not want you partnered with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Now, this is one of the things Paul taught that, uh, that people can twist and they could think, that means I'm supposed to find all the wrong and expose it. That's not what you're supposed to find. You're supposed to find all the ways that you don't love people, that you don't love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that you don't love people as yourself, and where other people in the body don't love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and don't love other people. It's not finding all the wrong doctrine. It's actually finding out where the leadership of the Spirit is absent. You get the leadership of the Spirit, you'll get right doctrine over time. You will mature into right doctrine. Okay? It's shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but in all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. And then he goes on to talk about relationships. This is all about relationships. So if you want that, if you want a grace to speak truth and love, I just want to pray for you and pray for me because I got convicted just while I was sharing this. So, Holy Spirit, I'm asking, would you give us a grace to just lower the bar on what we expect from everybody else to be holy, and that you would give us a grace to raise the bar on how weak we could be with you and still be right with you if we just let you correct us? Lord, would you help us raise the bar on our correctability, that we wouldn't be so quick to be offended or ashamed, that we'd say, of course, I don't do things right. I need Jesus, and I'm going to always need him. Or would you, give, would you free us from shame and condemnation and guilt? Would you help us just to be open people willing to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron, that we not give up the habit of meeting together, that we wouldn't isolate and protect ourselves, that we'd come together vulnerable because we want to be changed. We actually want to be agitated into holiness by other people. God, would you give us a grace to be pure and spotless when you come, Jesus? Not because... You waved your hand and ignored everything, but because you actually showed us truth in love and we changed. Would you help us to be like you in that? In Jesus' name, amen.